So, like you can calculate exactly when it will be one million. I can tell you exactly. I can tell you with it. But it's one of the way to test if a model will continue to work by the time we go back to the uh, next bottom, right? And that bottom should be around seventy, eighty thousand dollars, something like that. That means we will never see prices below that. Now there is a pattern here. And so that intrigued me as a physicist because it is what they do from morning to evening and look at patterns and try to understand mathematical relationship between things, etc. in different fields. But you don't think anymore as Bitcoin, like if it was a stock, as if it was a commodity, you're thinking like a system. Physicists started actually to, not just to study financial uh, matters, but even social topics like uh, how a city grows. If there is a, a really, really catastrophic event, well, then the model will break. This podcast is entertainment, not financial tax or legal advice. Views expressed represent statements of the speaker in their individual capacity, do not represent the views of Unchained, and should not be considered investment advice. Speakers often have personal family or business connections to Unchained, which may include direct financial benefits. Please see our disclosure at unchained.com slash podcast. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Bitcoin Frontier podcast. This week, I have on Giovanni, the creator of the Bitcoin Parallel model. Welcome. Yeah, thank you so much to um, having me in your show. Yeah, absolutely. Glad to have you. Uh, I want to start off with kind of learning more about you. How does a physicist get interested originally in Bitcoin? Well, uh, everybody should be interested in Bitcoin <laughs> and physicists even more because, uh, you know, of all the beautiful things about Bitcoin. But uh, uh, maybe maybe the general question is, so my, my personal story is that uh, uh, I did hear a bit about Bitcoin uh, very early on. I, I thought that I actually was late in comparison with uh, the really, really early people. Uh, and But, you know, I was... I, I was uh, involved uh, around, uh, I think, 2010, the first time I heard about Bitcoin. And in fact, I even downloaded the wallet uh, and I saw that there was this idea of mining. I, I was actually familiar with mining digital stuff because I was playing video games, you know, where uh, sometimes you do the mining activity, you know, and I thought, but, you know, I immediately understood that it was not like a video game. It was like the idea of mining something. I I was aware of, um, but, um, um, you know, I, I realized that this thing was a big deal, you know, that uh, eventually this thing will, will be very valuable. But I didn't have all the information, you know, because it was still uh, a very small group of people that were talking about Bitcoin and we were using a very um, difficult language, you know, for most people. I, I could understand it. I could understand the idea. Uh, but uh, I was not in 100%. I, that didn't give all my attention. So I read some of the instructions about this mining deal, and every time you could mine on your laptop or your desktop, uh, you didn't need a lot of ash power or, for sure, not specialized machines. And uh, um, and it seemed a little bit too complicated. Uh, I was busy. I thought, uh, uh, you know, that is always a mistake with Bitcoin. I will do it later, you know, like, okay. And I paid a, a big price because I could have mined hundreds of Bitcoin or even tens of these coins. Uh, it was still okay, you know, but uh, I put it in the background, uh, you know, the, in the sense of the back burner. I didn't do it. And then, and I still have a computer right now because uh, it's a reminder of how stupid I was uh, in dealing with Bitcoin by postponing, you know. And uh, I didn't do anything with it. And then later, uh, because of uh, yeah, well, several interests, one of, inter of my interests uh, is that uh, I like technology, I like uh, futurism, uh, in particular this movement that is called transhumanism. You know, I don't know if you know of Ray Kurzweil, uh, you know, all that stuff about one day we will be cyborgs and things like that. You know, and it's a good thing, you know, because we can live long lives and defeat aging, defeat. Uh, illness, we can go to Mars, you know, to explore a black hole or whatever. You know, I love, I love it kind of stuff. Uh, and uh, I, I got, um, uh, I was in a newsletter and uh, the newsletters um, said at a certain point this article uh, about this thing called Bitcoin. And, you know, it was an old friend. I heard about it before. And now 
it was a really a very nice article. In fact, I pinned it in my X account so people can go there and read it, etc. Mm-hmm. First of all, it's interesting to see these old articles about Bitcoin, you know, like what people were thinking at the time. But also, uh, it made a really very strong argument about why Bitcoin was important uh, from a technological point of view. So uh, you could understand the technology, what it does, why uh, is interesting. And, you know, if I was convinced before, now I was convinced even more. And I knew that it was a, a revolutionary idea. Uh, so that's always say, I don't understand people who say, I don't get Bitcoin. What, what do you mean? <laughs> it's so clear. You know, to me, for it was clear. But, you know, there was the other issue. It was, could it be also an investment, a long-term investment, right? And uh, in fact, the angle from the article was, oh, we are a transhumanist. Uh, we have all this great idea about, uh, you know, uh, feeding the world, uh, uh, going to Mars, uh, making people, um, you know, um, healthy and uh, maybe defeating aging, all these things that require a lot of money, you know, as projects. But, you know, most of us are professional, are scientists, etc. You know, we are okay economically, but we are not Elon Musk. But, you know, what if all of us became like little Elon Musk? You know, then we can support all these crazy projects and we can go to Mars faster, you know? And, uh, um, and so I really like that idea, not just about the money, because it's a mean, right? It's a mean for freedom. It's a mean to do whatever you want in terms of beautiful projects and things like that. And so I realized that this guy was right, that if you jumped in at that time, when nobody really knew about this thing and it was so revolutionary, yeah, there was a lot of chance for you to really become wealthy. And so that was an angle that was interesting to me. And the interesting thing also, at the end of the article, there was like this little chart. And the chart, it was like a very early model, probably one of the earlier. And uh, uh, it had like one year of data because we are talking about 2012, you know, this when the, this article came out. And, you know, the um, markets were open maybe like mid of 2010. So one year and a half of data, something was already a big bubble. The article was, uh, see, at that time, people were mentioning this tulips thing, right? You know about the tulips that I don't need to explain it. But uh, it was a big, people were repeating this. Now they repeated a little bit less. There are still some crazy people mentioning tulips today. You know, it's absurd. But at that time, uh, kind of seemed relevant because it could be that this thing goes up very fast and then it crashes because it's a some kind of a fade or something, you know. But, um, uh, you know, the guy was saying, well, you know, we had our big first bubble, you know, and bubbles never recover. Uh, and look at this, if the price is still going up. So, you know, he was using some logic and mathematical argument. And he even said, if you fit a straight line, you know, in this log graph, you know, he didn't love the log of the, uh, of the x-axis, that is my trick, he had the log on the y-axis, you can see a straight line. Uh, I was not really convinced about that straight line, but uh, the price seemed quite orderly. You know, it seemed like, oh, there is a pattern here. And so that intrigued me as a physicist because that was your question, right? Because this is what they do from morning to evening. I look at patterns and try to understand uh, mathematical relationship between things, etc., in different fields. Because in my career, I changed different fields. I went from astrophysics, then I went to neuroscience. Uh, so I studied, dif- you know, similar things in different contexts. Uh, like uh, you know, I studied uh, gravitational waves when I was uh, working in astrophysics. When I went uh, in neuroscience, where I was studying brain waves. But you know, that is part of my story. That is also related to Bitcoin because it's easy for me to go from astrophysics to neuroscience to finance, you know, to understanding prices. If these are patterns are universal. And this is how my mentality of physicists, we like to do that. We like to see universality. For us, uh, a spring is like a star, you know, that is expanding and contracting. Uh, it's like the brain waves. Uh, you know, you can model the same way that you model a spring. This is what we do. it. And for many people, it seems like crazy. What the spring has to do with brain waves? They are the same thing because they oscillate. Is our physicist thing. <laughs> you know, it's a it's a different way of world, looking at the world, but actually it helped me when I went to neuroscience because I was a newcomer, I got a patent in the field very quickly within like a couple of years of me being in the field. Uh, and I made actually big discoveries in the field 
by looking at things like a physicist. And then when I started to look at Bitcoin like a physicist, I immediately started to see patterns. And one of the first patterns I was looking for, mostly because I had this intuition that Bitcoin was a network, uh, a network of very precise behaviors that you can model and you can predict. And it's not like the normal technical analysis that people do, you know, like, oh, I'm trying to extrapolate some kind of a pattern in this uh, stock or in this, you know, commodity. It's much deeper because you're looking for some kind of principle that guides the behavior of a system. So you don't think anymore as Bitcoin, like if it was a stock, as if it was a commodity, you're thinking like a system, like some kind of thing, some kind of object that inter- has interacting parts like it could be a living organism, it could be a city. Like people started to study, uh, physicists started actually to not just to study financial uh, matters, but even social topics, like uh, how a city grows, how a social network grows. Because again, you can use the same techniques, the same uh, tools that we use in physics to understand the system. And it turns out they behave in a very organized fashion. That sounds crazy, right? Because you think, a city, you know, it's made of people, people do. No, because you look at how a city grows uh, and all these uh, different parameters, like the number of gas stations, that you know, looks crazy. The number of gas stations in a city follows a very precise pattern. The number of patterns, the number of jobs, the number, and nobody's really there saying, hey guys, let's get this number of jobs. It's all self-regulated. There are all these very complicated interactions that somehow, when they interact with each other, they show these very precise patterns. And you can study, and then you can use them to make predictions of what is going to happen in the future. And yes, it's a very strong prediction because it's not about, hey, you can look at the past to make prediction for the future. That is kind of true with things that are random because, you know, it happened in this way, it will happen in a completely different way in the future, even if you think there is a pattern there. But things that are not random, like these complex systems, then they will continue to do what they, they did in the past because that is their nature. You know, you found something very fundamental about the system. So that was my approach. And they started immediately, almost immediately, with Bitcoins, uh, finding these patterns. And, you know, because of a beautiful thing about Bitcoin is that it's like this uh, first experiment in that has so many components. There is a financial component, there is a social component, there is a physics component because you know people use energy to run the system, etc. And so you can study all these things and see how they interact with each other because we have all the data from the on-chain data, right? We can download it and then you can analyze, you can look at hash power, you can look up a number of addresses, you can look at uh, transactions. But this is what they did. They started like crazy because uh, you know my girlfriend sometimes sees on my screen and say, what the heck is going on there? Because I plot like 20 different things, you know, like I'm, and I can, I, I write these codes and then I want to see everything. I want to see, okay, what is hash power versus transaction, transactions versus price, price versus, and I start to see these connections, you know, and some of them are, in, you know, know there. Other times you use, you know, some more sophisticated tools, but, you know, my, one of my um, personal, but, I think even from my training, approaches is always start with intuition. Always start through understanding. You know, if the data makes sense and your eyes tells you there is something there, probably there is, you know, double check, use all your stuff, make sure that you're not fooling yourself. But first, trust your intuition, trust your understanding, trying to understand what is going on here, right? So, for example, when I did that, one of the first things I did was looking at addresses, and the addresses correlated very strongly with price. You know, I made these charts where I was plotting the log. And the log, why we use the log is because, you know, Bitcoin grew so much, it went from, you know, a few people using Bitcoin to thousands, tens of thousands. So, when you have something that changes so much, you want to use the log because it allows you to see better all these changes in scale. So you plot the log of addresses versus the log of price and think of the price, right? It went from a few cents, from $10, $100. And this was early on, like 2012, when I started to, or 13, when I started to do these graphs. And then you see this straight line 
like this graph, you see something that hey, it's weekly because you know you still have randomness, etc. But in general, there is a pattern. It's not if it was not pattern, the, the dots will be all over the place. They are not. They are organized. And then I started to say, okay, here there is something. What is going on? I, I knew that this thing co- is called a power law in physics. Um, and and I can tell you more about the details, what power laws are, or how they come up in nature and so on, and also in social phenomena. But uh, I recognized it. And then I started to research. Like, for example, I, didn't, I knew a little bit about networks, but I started to, I wanted to learn more. And, you know, I found out there was this thing called Metcalf. I didn't really know up, up to that time. And Metcalf is this relationship that uh, uh, somebody derived just from theory, just from thinking uh, about how networks uh, uh, are characterized. In particular, what is important about that networks is uh, how people are connected with each other, right? Or nodes in a system. It could be computers, it could be people. And he, he, I think he was thinking this uh, Metcalf um, person, this uh, professor, he was thinking about uh, telephone lines, right? And landforms, not even because of, he did it this early on. And his uh, conclusion was, if you have a, a system that is like a network and you want to sign value. So what is value? In this case, could be the utility, how useful this system is for your purpose, like making people connect with each other, for example. Or it could be even a monetary value because maybe the company is being traded on the stock market or whatever. So his idea was uh, the value, the usefulness of the system is proportional to the number of users, that is intuitive, right? Let's always think about what something means before just using some random math. And then he, just by logic, uh, you know, and how he derived it, I, I don't want to go into the details, he arrived to the conclusion that uh, it is proportional to the square. And what is the relevance of that? The relevance of that, because that is the next step, right? When you can find the formula, then you think, okay, what this means? Right? What is the uh, implication? The implication is that if you are interested in making your company more valuable, and of course, the first thing you want to do is to have more users. It makes sense, right? That is one of the things that people do when you create a uh, you know, YouTube account or X account, you want to borrow more followers. But the question is, any benefit that you get from this network, is it going to be going up with the... Uh, just linearly with the number of uh, users. So if I double the, the number of my followers, will I get uh, two times the reward? No. Metcalf says in the ideal connection, it's, there is a, a little trick where he, he assumes that everybody is connected with everybody else. He will go up by a factor of four. So you double, it goes up with a four because of the square, right? Two to the square is four. Three times, you triple it, then it goes to the nine. So three to the square is nine. So you see how fundamental this discovery is because it tells you, whoa, you know, I get four times the benefit by simply doubling the number of users of this network. And so I thought, I, when I read that, when I started to study these properties of network, I thought, okay, of course I see that uh, nice straight line because, you know, I'm using addresses that is kind of a proxy for uh number of users or, you know, the activity of a network and the price, which is the value of a network, will be connected, right? Because of there is actually theory. Now, by measuring the slope of that straight line, you can derive some relatively simple math to show this is the case, that little power that we mentioned, right? So Metcalf say it is square. And so when I measure it for Bitcoin, it was not square. It was like 1.5 or something like that. That is interesting because, see, one thing is the theory, one thing is the real data. So first of all, you know, what, what that means? It means that um, it's kind of like Metcalf. So he was right. It goes with, it's a power law. It goes, because power law, what power law means is any time you have a quantity that is related to another quantity by the power. And with power, we need that little exponent. It's just a technical term that we use in physics, the power. So you raise it to the power. So in Metcalf, the power is two. Okay? It's a very simple concept. Every time you have something that looks like y equal x, 
to the n, some kind of number, that is called a power law. And this power law, a sim very simple equation, right? Very, very simple, but they come up for some reason everywhere in nature, but also social and financial um, systems. And, uh, and so when I measured it, it was 1.5. And so, you know, I made actually a post, and that is part of what I did from the beginning instead of publishing in some, you know, journal, because actually, you know, with time, Bitcoin became actually, I don't know if many people know that, but, uh, you know, there are serious scientists that publish papers on Bitcoin, on the property of Bitcoin. You can publish in different journals, even physics journal, or, you know, economics journals. And I could have published a paper, and in fact, Four years later, somebody published a paper exactly mentioning this thing that I found it early. But, you know, I posted on Reddit. <laughs> so it was mostly, you know, I posted on Reddit because I care about the community. I wanted the community, you know, Bitcoin, the vertices of the other exciting thing when I discovered it was a, a community where were people discussing this idea. You know, I was very excited and I thought, I'm going to share this thing. Everybody will be amazed by this. Not because I'm amazed about how clever I am, but about Bitcoin. It was all about showing how wonderful Bitcoin was, you know, that it was behaving in this very regular fashion. So I got excited. I got to upload it and I made a post to say, hey, I'm comparing Metcalf, Bitcoin, and Zip Law. Because I actually, in my research, I found an article that was uh, claiming that Facebook was also power law, the value of, of uh, Facebook. And then eventually didn't follow it anymore, but for some time, you follow a type of power law that was called Zipf's law. And, uh, uh, and so the evaluation of, of Facebook was very close to this model of the Zipf's law. And so I compare, I compare these three models. I say, hey, here how Bitcoin looks like. Um, and I made some kind of complicated model where uh, uh, I linked the addresses to the price by the, the via of this power law. And then I say, well, how addresses will grow up in time, right? And I thought it will, they will grow up like the adoption curve of technologies that probably you heard about, right? Have you ever seen these S curves, right? That yep. uh, show how people adopt uh, refrigerators, TVs, cell phones. It applies to so many different technologies. So I thought it will apply the same thing will apply with Bitcoin. So if you assume that uh, addresses are going to go up, the only thing I didn't know was the saturation point. How many people will adopt Bitcoin when, you know, when the curve, usually these S-curves, they flatten out. That means everybody has that technology. Or, you know, if it is a particular technology, maybe just a portion of uh, humans are going to use that, right? And so I thought, you know, maybe, maybe 50% of uh, uh, mankind is going to use Bitcoin or 30%. So you can make different models according to the final scenario. This is what happens if 50% are going to adopt. This is what happens if 30%. 10%. Then you can see the different scenarios and where price is going. So you can draw different curves. You know, there is some uncertainty there, but it's still interesting, right? Because you have all these scenarios. And this is what my first publication. I could have pu published a nice paper and have my name, you know, attached to the paper, but they published on Reddit. That you know, was silly. But, you know, that was my way of connecting with the community to let everybody know that there were these irregularities. And it was mixed if you go there and read this bit. It's silly how people, you know, some people react nice and they say, oh, wow, you know, that. and other people, you know, trolls, you know, that uh, are trying to put it down and so on. But uh, this is where I started. And then, you know, I continued this research. I was like, I never stop. I continue to try to understand Bitcoin more and more using scientific tools. So, you know, everybody's familiar with uh, Plan B and S2F. Uh, he's a newcomer in comparison with me. I was doing what S2F did. For some reason, his model caught up, you know, and many people fell in love with it, et cetera. I have my things to say about that, but uh, let, let's, let's postpone maybe uh, what they think about S2F. In this frontier moment, Giovanni addresses the concerns around the stock to flow model, comparing it with his power law model. Here's a chart that overlaps both so you can see how the models vary over time. As you can see, the stock to flow model is exponential and begins to significantly diverge above Giovanni's power law model over the long run. Now, which model is right? Well, no model is perfect, and in the long run, they are both likely to ultimately break up or down. What could break Giovanni's model to the upside 
could be something along the lines of a phase shift, which would be a severe change in the environment or circumstances. Maybe this would be severe inflation, a full transition to a Bitcoin standard, or exponential technology growth making the price of Bitcoin increase rapidly in terms of everyday goods. But time will tell. And now back to Giovanni. Yeah, that is my story. I'm sorry if I took all this time and didn't let you ask me a question. <laughs> but, no, no, uh, that, yeah, was go, go. <laughs> that was a, a great background of you recognizing all of these patterns and then you eventually seeing a pattern within the price of Bitcoin. Maybe can you show the audience the, your power law model and like explain you know, yes. what's unique about it? I know like the, the x-axis is in log form, which is Correct. interesting. So yeah, so I have this uh, um, uh, this uh, power law presentation here, and uh, hopefully you can see it in the screen. Uh, so this is the normal chart, right? But uh, I'm actually uh, sometimes I make joke. I even have a meme. Maybe I can share the meme with you in the end of the presentation. But basically, this is what you usually see on CNBC. You know, all all, uh, all this you know crammer. Cr cr all the time talks about this, shows this chart because it looks like it looks bad, right? Because it really doesn't look like there is uh, any pattern. Yeah, in general, it looks with uh, like it's going up. But you know, imagine I am here. So what I, what are you seeing? Usually they show dates, right? But uh, in in my calculation, I'm using always days. Days is my um, what I plot on the uh, x-axis, and these days are always in reference to the Genesis block. So when the Bitcoin was created, that is January 3rd, 2009. Uh, and so these days that I'm mentioning here are days from the Genesis block, right? But usually they don't do this, but you know, you have dates, but it's the same thing. So basically we have uh, the X axis where you have time linear. And then in this case, it's also the price that is linear, okay? So you have like 10,000, 20,000, 30,000. I'm using this scientific notation that, you know, hopefully it's easy to understand, but uh, some people have problems with it. But the main point is, if you do a linear chart like this, that is what most uh, of these uh, financial show, uh, show to the public, it doesn't look there is any particular pattern. And in fact, you know, right now it's nice because the price is going up. So, okay, crash, recover. But, you know, imagine I show you after a big crash, you know, it looks like, see, it is tulips all over again. You know, we reached this top. Everybody was excited. We bought over there. But look at, the, at this where it is now. And then, of course, you will go to zero, right? So it's what people use to kind of criticize Bitcoin. So it's easy to criticize Bitcoin if you look at this chart. Then, you know, if you do something that is quite done often in whenever you have a, an asset, that uh, uh, changes price, right? Like if you look at SP500 over several years, it went up a bit, you know, not nothing in comparison with Bitcoin. It looks like flat when you compare it with Bitcoin, but it went up, right, over maybe 30 years. And so you want to use the log on the Y-axis because in that way you can see kind of in the same way, it's a way of making equal changes uh, of uh, 10, right? So when uh, when you go from, let's say, uh, uh, Apple stock being valued $10, uh, then $100, then, you know, $1,000, whatever, you know, I know that it's not $1,000. But if you have a, a stock that changes price like that uh, over a long period of time by factors of 10, it's better to use the log because then it, it allows you to see things. In, like I, I call it like a, a bird view. It's like, you know, you have a drone and you go and fly and you see things from a different height. And so you can see the entire pattern. And when you do that with Bitcoin, you see this very nice progression. You know, it doesn't look messy like before anymore. Yes, there are these periods where the price goes up and, you know, these bubbles and it goes crazy when it comes back, and etc. But in general, it looks, is Bear in a very regular fashion. And yeah, it's kind of slowing down in this chart. It's not really slowing down. It's, it's uh, if you really plotted the curve, uh, in, in, and it's not clear in the linear chart, but if you simplify maybe by averaging and so, 
it will look like a parabola, really. Uh, but in this graph, what looks like straight line will be exponential. So if you add something that goes very fast up like an exponential, in a graph like this, it will look like a straight line. So the fact that it doesn't look like a straight line tell us that the progression is there, is going up, numbers go up, and it's true, but not as fast like if it was an exponential. And so this chart demonstrates that, because like I say, I repeat, an exponential will look like a straight line. It's not intuitive, but if, if you understand what a log, or what is a log? A log, basically, it's kind of, uh, you can think it almost like a little box, right? So I have this mathematical box where I have an input, the input is my number. So let's say that there are different types of logs, but the easiest one is the log of 10, so base 10. So it means if I express a number as a, a power of 10, so for example, let's say 1,000, right? How can we write 1,000 with the number 10? Well, 10 to the 3, right? 10 times 10 times 10 is what 10 to the 3 means. It's 1,000. So I put in, right, like as a, the input, my 1,000 in this little box, and the log spits out as output the exponent. So it gives me the exponent. It gives me 3. So, well, let's do it again. Let's put uh, 100, 10 to the 2. We get what if we do that? We get 2, right? Then if I put 10,000, right? 10,000 is 10 times 10 times 10, four times, right? Uh, that is 10 to the 4. The log of 10 or 10 to the 4 is 4. So this is what actually I show here. I show it in this way where, uh, you know, 0 is uh, actually uh, 1 because 10 to the 1, uh, so 10 to the 0 is 1, right? Uh, 1 is 10 to the 1, that is 10. 2 is 10 to the 2, that is 100,000. You know, 10,000, 100,000, a million, right? 10 to the 6 is a million. So it's the number 6 when you take the log. It's simple enough, right? Uh, and this is what you get. It's uh, It looks uh, pretty uh, regular, right, when you do it in that way. But, you see, the human eye is not able to look at a graph like that and say, oh, yeah, I see this equation. There is, you know, there are tools. You can use uh, mathematical tools that will tell you this procedure is called fitting. Uh, and so regression. So you do a regression calculation. And today with modern computers, it will even give you the equations and the parameters of the equation. So you will try maybe different things. You can try an exponential. It will be very bad fit because, as we say, it's a straight line. And again, why is a straight line? Now that we know what logs do, if you have an exponential, the log is the opposite, you know, the inverse in a certain sense of an exponential. So it will basically uh, take, you know, like neutralize that exponential. So it will make it look like a line instead of uh, uh, being something that grows like a hockey stick. Okay, so an exponential looks like a straight line in a graph like this. Uh, and so, um, you know, you could try different type of uh, mathematical equation until you get something that uh, it's a good approximation of a price. Uh, but, you know, you will still kind of, if, even if you do that, you will still doubt because, you know, these mathematical tools are okay, but, uh, you know, uh, sometimes they're just approximation of what uh, is going on, you know. So, and for sure, the human eyes cannot see that. You can see there is a regularity. You can start to see that, oh, wow, you know, this looks nice. And it seems that it's following some kind of path. But it's very different from this, okay? So this graph that I'm showing you right now is where my big revelation came. Mm -hmm. And what did they do? Well, it's kind of what I did when I look at addresses, when I look at transactions. I always did this log-log graph where I was looking at the relationship between all these on-chain quantities. It didn't come to my mind. So I then, you know, I could use that information to do this two-step process where I will take, oh, I see a power law between addresses of transactions and price. And then I can use that because now I know how addresses are related to price, if I know how the addresses change in time, I can do the second step and make a chart of price versus time. That is what we want because if we want to see, my goal was, you know, going to the article that I mentioned before, is this guy's right that, uh, you know, the 
Bitcoin in 10 years from now will be 100,000. You know, 20 years from now will be 1 million. That was my goal. I wanted to see if it was a way, a mathematical way of projecting the price, not, you know, day by day, you know, what it does, you know, one month from now, but what it does in five years, 10 years, 20 years from now, right? That was the general goal. Is there a way of making this price movement based on mathematics where we can make a very rough prediction about the long-term trajectory of Bitcoin. So I was doing it in this two-step way. And, you know, the models were there, but there were a lot of assumptions. There were a lot of uh, other conditions, you know, like uh, you need to have a model of how the prices move. You need to have, a, you know, do you remember when I told you if you use this logistic model, you need to know how many people in the end are going to adopt and all these as extra stuff. And one day, for some reason, I decided I'm going to plot directly the price versus time in a log log chart. And to many people, that sounds crazy because what do you mean you're taking the log of time? Well, I can take the log of anything, right? They, in fact, at a certain point when we started to... Uh, so the history of the power law is that uh, there was this uh, very bright young person that... Uh, Look at my Reddit post because once once I found this, I posted on Reddit, my favorite scientific journal, you know. <laughs> and so I posted there, and I say, "Hey, look at this! Uh, power, there is a, a power law directly between um, the price and time." And again, it was kind of a, you know, how many likes? Maybe hundred upvoting or something like that, hundred thirty, and uh, many people were criticizing. Many people didn't understand. They say, oh, you know, we see log charts all the time. No, you never saw the log of price and the log of time. This is very unique. With tax day on April 15th, high net worth Bitcoin holders could be leaving a lot of money on the table if they don't have a sound financial plan and tax strategy. Sound Advisory is a leading financial advisory firm for long-term Bitcoin holders like yourself. They can help you maximize your Bitcoin wealth while navigating the complexities of the legacy financial system. Don't get killed on taxes. Check out Sound Advisory at thesoundadvisory.com for more information. That's thesoundadvisory.com. Now back to the show. And look at this. And to me, as a scientist, it looks striking because, you know, I heard somebody, I think it was uh, this show called uh, What the... Uh, uh, Bitcoin did or something like that, right? It's yeah. an uh, internet show. And these guys were showing these charts and uh, uh, they were saying, they use this expression. This is a chart that you cannot unsee. This, this, they use that expression. When I saw this chart, I could not unsee it myself because I saw that the price is super regular. It looks like a straight line, right? Yes. It's a, there are these bumps, it goes up and down, but it follows along a straight line. Do you agree? Do you agree, Joe? Does it look yeah. like that? The, the one question that I have is, yes. what, what is that you know, light blue line that is... Yeah, yeah. So made? that is an addition uh, that okay. I had it to, you know, to account for these bubbles, right? Because it's a, there are two, almost like two components. There is this overall linear trajectory. Remember, it's linear in these log-log graph, right? Yep. So it's not linear in the in, in a normal graph that needs to be interpreted. You know, what does it mean? What are the consequences? Uh, why is like that, et cetera? And, and we can go through that in a, in a second. But then, at a certain point, I decided, well, you know, there is also this other component that is the bubbles, and I want, how can I uh, add that component? And I said, you know, and this is where, for example, Plan B was very important, a contributor in because you know all of us, independently of one model being better than the other, etc. There are different people in the community that try trying to understand what is what Bitcoin is doing, and they are using different tools. So one of the contribution of Plan B was he said that these alvings. So here, for example, in my chart are the red stars. The red stars are the alvings mm -hmm. are somehow associated with this. Bubbles, you know, that uh, people in the beginning associated with Bitcoin being a tulip, but, you know, like the guy in the article say, well, the price continues to go up and tulips never did that. They stay, yeah. they crash and they stay there, right? And now you can buy 
a tulip just for you know a few cents. Uh, so this is not tulips, right? And but at the same time, we have this strange phenomena, you know, of a bubble where the price goes up very much, reaches a, a top, and then it comes back, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, um, and one of the things that you can see in this model, first of all. So this, what these bands represent before we go to the blue line. The bands mm -hmm. represent deviations, right? So 10% deviation, 20% deviation. Here in the little um, legend, you can see that. I, uh, I explained what they are, right? So there are deviations above the trend. The trend is the orange line in the middle. And then we have these bands which represents deviations. So 20% deviation from the trend, 40%. And, and look, for example, how the deviation that uh, I call minus 40%, right, can follow very, very, very closely the bottoms. So when we reach these bottoms, you see they seem to behave in a very regular fashion yep. following this band, right? You agree with that? So yep. maybe uh, in 2020, not so much, you know, the, that little dip that you see there in the, in the last uh, cycle is the COVID. You know, mm -hmm. There was a big dip of the price. But even there, <laughs> it touched at uh, the bottom of a green line, and then it went up. And now, you know, in, uh, in the last uh, bottom, the last bottom seems to follow very nice, but uh, seems to be confined within that uh, green band, right? So this chart tells us a lot of, shows a lot of regularities in Bitcoin price. And what is amazing that every time we have a bubble, even the first one, why the, the first one was very different from the other ones because it was not associated with Alvin's. We did not yet an Alvin. So, you know, one should not go back and try to understand why do we, did we have this bubble, right? Yeah. Uh, it was not associated with any Alvin, you know, something else made it up, right? And so this is why, for example, I, I don't, the, these uh, sine waves uh, don't follow this because I try to only model the bubbles after the outings. So gotcha. I, don't, I don't include that one. But uh, so to answer your question, what I, 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 you know, there are two components. That is the general overall trend of Bitcoin that seems to follow this power law. So it's another power law. So it means that, remember, every time we talk about power law, it means uh, that uh, we have one quantity related to the other by the power. And we can look at that in a moment. But on top of that, because I wanted to explain also the bubble, explain here, and this is another thing that sometimes people are confused. This, what is, this, this is called a heuristic model. So it means that you don't make any assumption. You don't say, hey, there is this thing that causes this. You simply say, look, I see this very regular behavior. I think it means something. And I want to create like a little equation that, tries to follow as close as possible, but simplifying, because I, I'm not trying to get every single little movement. I'm trying to get the general direction. I'm going to write a simple equation that describes a general pattern. And then, because in the, the beauty of doing it with time itself is that now you have time, and you can plug in any time. You can plug future time. Remember what was the goal. What Bitcoin is going to do in 10 years. So you can plug in that little equation of time, you know, the number of days from the genesis, because this is what we use all the time. Now, here I use dates because people will always complain. Can you put dates? Can you put dates? Okay, let me put dates. I put dates. And dates behave in a funny way. You can see that we are clustering because what happens here, we are kind of using this funny time where uh, time becomes longer and longer and longer. You know, we are kind of stretching time because our intention is to show how the price change is kind of related in terms of changes of 10 to the changes in time by factor of 10 too. So I'm looking at 10 days, 100 days, 1,000 days, 10,000 days, and the two are related to each other because I see a straight line. That is the significance of the power law. It's a way to show if a system is, you know, as is, what is called scale. So we use this terminology. So scales means changes of 10. So the price went from, you know, a cent to $1, then from $1 to $10, $10 to 100, and also 
time change, right? We had these very exciting first days of Bitcoin birth, where uh, you know price was almost nothing, and then we had at this time, so when you know in 2010, 11, you know when the price went up like crazy, you know from a few cents to a dollar, etc. And so what happened is Bitcoin somehow has this other way of behaving where it cares about scales. It doesn't care about your human time that is linear. It care, cares about thinking about time or operating under this time where times, what matters, it's how the, how the time changes in terms of scale. So it, how it went from a few days, 10 days, 100 days, so we're talking about months, and then from hundreds to a thousand, so we're talking about years, then decades, you know, the next the next step is the next decade. So it will take one decade for the price to go up as a, um, a factor of 10. So that is the main message. If you really want, want to understand, and it's important, it doesn't matter if you're a mathematician or if you are just a common person, the main message here is that Bitcoin based in a very regular fashion in terms of scales both in time and in price. And the two, because of a straight line, straight line, what a straight line is, it's a regularity. It's a you know, straight line grows in a very regular fashion, right? It's a constant growth. That constant growth is not in linear time, it's in log time. So when people dive a joke and I will say, Bitcoin is time, where I say, well, actually Bitcoin is log time. And it's actually very interesting because it does tell us a lot of things. There is, I point out how this model, because I remember from the beginning, I say we are not looking for some kind of, uh, you know, uh, technical analysis. I say that this is not technical analysis. This is a deep dive in some fundamental properties, like a physicist will look at about Bitcoin. And so this scale is called scaling variance. The fact that what Bitcoin did when it was very small. And then when he was like a little teenager and when he became a you know a young adult and now it's you know it's growing and you know strong man and so on, a woman, whatever, you know, like a this analogy of a living organism is growing and becoming bigger and stronger. What matters are the changes in time. That means it basically does the same thing over and over and over because of this straight line. But if you look at it from that point of view, it didn't change. He continued to do his own thing. That is amazing because, first of all, it, uh, it gives us confidence that we can extrapolate this behavior in the future because if it, Bitcoin did the same thing when he went from a few cents to a dollar, one dollar to a hundred, and so on, he will do the same thing when he went from, when he goes from, you know, from 10,000 or 50,000 to uh, 500,000 and a few millions. It's just a couple of steps in terms of order of magnitude, right? Going to a million is just another 10 factor, and going to 10 million is another 10 factor. So if you need these other a range, see, this is the other amazing thing here. Uh, and the other day, I actually was showing even transactions before um, a market open. It's like a, it was a very early transaction, so we, you know, that of one of the early followers of Nakamoto, actually the first person that was helping uh, Satoshi to code, and uh, he was trying to give popularity to Bitcoin, and he was selling Bitcoin, you know, like one dollar, ten thousand, you know, many thousands of Bitcoin, and they put that little transaction, which is actually the first transaction in history for you know between Bitcoin and uh, the dollar, and it kind of followed because almost like a little bit below the trend line. That is kind of crazy, completely crazy, right? And yeah. So if you take even in consideration with early transaction, we're talking about nine order of magnitude of change, which is amazing. There is no one single asset on earth that, first of all, changed so much in such short time, but also that follow this incredible power law. So it's a big, big deal. And I would like more scientists to look at this and say, what is going on here? You know, and discuss it with me. I, am I doing something wrong? Because, you know, it could be. Could be that I'm saying something silly, but I don't. I don't think so because you can do it by hand. I try to go at different dates, but, you know, go up a factor of ten every time, you know, both in time and price. Do it by hand, you know. 
like an average price and see if what I'm saying is true. It takes longer and longer and longer for the price to go up. Now, some people hate it because they think, I want these to explode. I want the God candle. I want, and I'm always telling them, listen, we have all this vocabulary, all this imaginary in Bitcoin. I, for example, we look at the God, the uh, Bitcoin standard because there are a lot of little beautiful lessons there, right? One of the lessons there is this idea of preference time. So this power law is an incarnation, mathematical expression of that principle. Because what it's telling you is be patient. Bitcoin is going to do this thing and it's unavoidable. It's not an opinion. It's not like a guess. If it is true, that is following this very fundamental principle, it will continue to do that. And so it's almost like you can calculate exactly when it will be 1 million. And it's going to be in 10 years from now. In this frontier moment, Giovanni is talking about Bitcoin potentially reaching 1 million in the next 10 years. Now, are you comfortable with the security and custody of your Bitcoin if it's really worth that much? Protecting your Bitcoin is like protecting your family. A single centralized custodian is like a single engine plane you haven't inspected. Would you send each of your family members on a different single engine plane to disperse risk? Or would you all go on one plane with more than one engine? This is collaborative custody. This is the idea of a network of keys. With an unchained personal vault, Unchained has a backup key or engine in this analogy, and Unchained's enterprise custody product enables companies and high net worth individuals to choose from a variety of key agents or pick multiple backup engines in this analogy. This is the power of collaborative custody. And now back to Giovanni. I can tell you exactly. I can tell you the date. Now, you know, because it's a rough estimate, it could be one month later, it could be five months later, but you know, the year I'm pretty sure, and that year is 2033. So it's telling you, you know, hold the Bitcoin now. You, you Even if you come in, imagine if you bought it the last cycle. But if you buy it now, even if it is 60,000 or 65 or whatever it is, it's still going up by another factor of 20. You know, it's going all the way to a million dollars. So it's an incredible investment within a 10 years, right? And be like the child, like, you know, one of the things that uh, the Bitcoin standard talks about is this experiment where uh, children were given a cookie. And then the experiment, right, the psychologist says, hey, you can have two cookies if you can wait. I'm going somewhere. I'm going to grab something, and I'm coming back. And I will give you two cookies if you can oddle, right, oddle on your cookie, <laughs> and uh, uh, I will give you two, okay? And then the child says, yeah, 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 of course. Then they come out of the room, and a lot of children, I, am I, I don't know, I, I need to read papers about that topic at some point. But I guess actually a lot of children, probably the majority of children, cannot resist, right? And some people, some children resist a little bit more. There are all these cute videos. I don't know if you ever saw. I saw some documentaries where they're showing this experiment. And, you know, they salivate, they all they try not to look at the cookie. And it's like so super cute, right? Super cute. And then finally they grab a cookie and they eat it. A lot of children. And some children... Yeah, you know, the temptation is there, it's difficult, they distract themselves, but they oddle. They oddle, and when they come back, they get to cookies. This is the expression of that. That is what this graph is teaching. See, it's much more than just fitting some data. There is so much in understanding in this chart. And uh, uh, so, you know, it's not exploding. It's not going crazy. It's going, not going, it's, it's parabolic, actually super parabolic, but in comparison with an exponential that most people think about when they say parabolic, it's uh, actually there. You know, they don't know these mathematical terms. They say parabolic and really they mean exponential. They're different. This is parabolic, but it's not exponential. For example, S2F is exponential. Mm. And many people really love that model because they see this crazy growth. You know, his plan B is predicting 500,000. I'm predicting 200,000, you know. And actually, 500,000 is very conservative for uh, S to S. It should be like a million if you really follow the map. But, you know, next cycle, S to S predicts 10 million because basically is 
math is that every time we have a cycle, we go up by a factor of 10. We do not go up by a factor of 10 in this cycle. I just say it will take 10 years, not four. So it's a different philosophy. It's actually basically the opposite philosophy. And I tell you something, in physics, so there is a, uh, maybe you want to link it in your uh, video, uh, there, is, there is this series of lectures, because scientists study this property of systems with different types of um, growths, you know, exponential growths, power law growths, and so on. And for example, cities behave in this way. And there is this uh, uh, scientist, his name is Jeffrey West, he made a career, and he has a book, he has lectures, so maybe you want to link to them because they are very interesting, very beautiful, not just about Bitcoin, but understanding a lot of different things in nature and social phenomena. And uh, he makes this analogy, says cities are immortal, they don't die. And not, notice, for example, Sailor talks about Bitcoin like if it was a city. Again, his, his intuition tells him something, you know, maybe he's not aware of the power law, but this is what it's telling us, that uh, the growth of Bitcoin looks like the growth of a city. And cities never die. They are, because when, one of the characteristics of power law is being resilient. They are resistant to changes, both positive and negative, but they are steady. They are strong. They are resilient. You can perturb. This is why, for example, my interpretation of a bubble is that it's a perturbation, what we call in physics a perturbation. It means you're changing. You are pushing the system. You are stressing it. Like, you know, for example, there is a branch on a tree, I give it a kick, right? I give it a, a hit, and the branch will react by oscillating, by, you know, uh, going back and forth. And then finally, what happens? Over time, it comes down and this go back to where it was before. That is what is called a perturbation. Well, that is the same thing with this bubble. We are perturbing because there is some event that changes how Bitcoin works, what are these alvings, and that perturbation creates these spikes, and then the price goes back. Look how, notice how after the bubble, some invisible ant brings back the price of Bitcoin to the general trend. So there is something going on there, something very deep. And so if you have, if you understand, if you change your vision about Bitcoin using this power law as your kind of key, all these different ideas and concepts come about. You're, it's about resilience. If you want Bitcoin to be the monetary system of reward, we want to root for this because it means that it's stable. It is going to be able to handle the growth that is going ahead. And, you know, if uh, ETFs are coming along, maybe many people are asking me all the time, what about the ETF? Don't the ETF change everything? No, because you don't realize because you're thinking like a human and not like Bitcoin that ETFs are the proportional event, remember scale. So they look big to us because we look at these big things. And we say, oh, this is different. No, it's not different if you think in terms of scale. It's very similar to other events that Bitcoin went through to make it grow where it is right now. So ETFs are the thing that Bitcoin needs at this particular time. And in a certain sense, it attracts, right? So you're thinking in a different way. It's not that now, oh, these guys are coming in and changing the trajectory of Bitcoin. No, Bitcoin is attracting like a black hole all these events at the right time because it's a kind of a feedback loop. In the beginning, there were only a few people because it was just an idea. You know, people didn't test it. They didn't understand it. So a few people that could appreciate started to join in in this project. And, you know, Satoshi was letting people know. And people were bringing resources, energy, literally, you know, by running the system and money because they started to do these first transactions. You know, 10,000 coins, $1. Can you imagine? Crazy, right? But it was the right proportional event for Bitcoin where it was at the time of its history. You know, it's like when you play a video game and you're fighting monsters, the monsters are proportional to your level, you know, of as a, as a player. As you go up, you fight stronger and stronger monsters. It's like that because it's programmed to be like that to say, well, how this applies to Bitcoin. There is, there is now like somebody deciding, you know, no, it's, you know, it, like a feedback loop, so it out self regulates. But uh, uh, you know, as the system grows and becomes stronger and more attractive, it brings more resources proportional to where Bitcoin is. So ATFs is this event 
in the history of Bitcoin that is proportional to all the other events. And so what that means is that, yes, the ETFs are very important. I'm not trying to put down the importance of ETFs. It's great. It's amazing. We should celebrate it. But it's exactly what Bitcoin needs to go to this level of 10 in 10 years. It, it, it is what it will allow Bitcoin to go on at a factor of 10. And then when we go there, some other crazy thing will happen where, you know, maybe a large nation like, uh, you know, Russia or China or US are going to adopt Bitcoin as their standard. And that will be an epochal event, but it will be what is needed for Bitcoin to go to the next level. You see how this philosophy, and it's not just philosophy, it's based on data, right? So it's a worldview, whatever you want to call it, but it's very coherent, right? It's, it's all connected and it gives you a different key. Now, am I right or no? I don't know. Right now, it seems the data supports it, right? We would love to see if I am right. So it's a science hypothesis. We will test it. If I if it is wrong, or the, well, how will you know that it is wrong? That is the other beautiful thing about the model, because if we are wrong, or if something changes, first of all, it's not wrong, because we know that Bitcoin has done this thing for 15 years. So at least historically, to understand Bitcoin, it's an important factor to understand the scaling property of Bitcoin. It, it, will it continue to do that? That is our hypothesis, that uh, being a strong system, being a scaling various system, going up another factor of 10 or 2 is nothing because it did it for nine, nine times, this uh, change of scales. So if you did it for nine times, you will do it also for two. But I could be wrong, right? Maybe, maybe some time, and that also what happened in the physics of uh, uh, this type of system, this power law, sometimes there are these things called phase changes, phase transitions. And that can happen when a system has a very dramatic change. Like if you, for example, let's say you have water, water became size. It's something so dramatic that whatever you apply to describe water doesn't apply anymore to describe ice. Or if uh, water goes from uh, being liquid to a gas, very different system. So in physics, we call this Rapid changes, phase transitions. And the system now from that moment on can still be described with some laws, etc. but it will be a different law. So what probably will happen if the economy continues to be like a network, etc. maybe this large event and I'm wrong and the TF is a phase transition, then maybe there is like a, a slope starts to be steeper. So it will still maybe behave like a power law or maybe starts to be an exponential, who knows? i rather, you know, it's not about wishful think, thinking, it's about what I hope Bitcoin is, is that this network that is driven by power law, because power law has a sign of stability. As a, they are anti-fragile, they, um, they can be stable, you know, exponential stuff. And this is what uh, that scientist that I was mentioning always uh, compared it like it turns out, for example, that uh, companies are like that. They grow very, very, very fast. And then eventually what they do, they crash. Like cities, you know, Rome, my, I am Italian, you know, my, city, my my capital of my country is there since like, you know, more than 2,000 years. It's an immortal city. In Italy, we say it's a città eterna. It's an eternal city. You know, and that is a characteristic of many cities. They are eternal. Uh, you can nuke them or think about uh, Nagasaki and Hiroshima. They come back to life. It's a property of networks that behave like power law. And there are different reasons. You, you, you guys can look at these videos that I mentioned, read the book. There is an entire book called Scale that discusses this in details. And so if that is true, then I would rather Bitcoin be, be, behave in these very uh, positive, you know, very consistent, very stable way than being an exponential and eating my cookie because many times they almost annoy me you know i try to be patient but you know all these people they want these gold candles and exponential growth they are like one cookie children you know i'd rather be uh i, I say and the equation right we were talking about equation the equation looks uh um like this the price is equal to some kind of constant the constant is not important it's basically tell us what the price of Bitcoin was when it was at time zero, that in fact this constant is 10 to the minus 17, which means zero, 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 you know, 16 zeros, one dollar. <laughs> that was the price of Bitcoin uh, after one day <laughs> was basically nothing, you know, 
And, uh, and then, like I told you, every time you have a power law, you have some quantity. In this case, it's time, right? Because we have time on the x-axis to some kind of exponent. In this case, I call it alpha. And that exponent turns out to be 5.82. Why is 5.82? I don't know. And this needs to be studied, you know, explored, discovered, but it is that number. And that means, first of all, it looks like a parabola because para what parabolas are? Parabolas are, you know, time to a square. If it was like a parabola in time, right? Square is a parabola. This is a super parabola. It goes even faster than a parabola. So when people think that this is bearish, they don't know what they're talking about. It's still a very incredible fast growth, even now, you know, because 10, a factor of 10 in 10 years, which stock can it do that? No, no stock, no gold, nothing can do that, right? Just Bitcoin. And at the same time, you know, uh, it's, it's very predictable. We have this, uh, this equation. It's amazing that we can describe this complex behavior with one single equation. And there is a little tool, you know, if you talk with uh, mathematicians and, and, you know, they will kind of laugh a little bit when they say this is a very, very important number. It, it, it is and it is not, but just roughly, this number is one of the statistical tools that we use. You have to use it carefully, but, and, you know, the, everything we do with this stuff needs to be taken. Yeah, it can be inspiring, but also be careful. Uh, this number tell us how precise this fitting is. In other words, you know, if it was perfect, if, uh, you know, the Bitcoin price was a perfect straight line in a log log graph, it will, that number will be one. And so, and zero, if it, you know, if it was just a bunch of random dots all over the place. But it's actually 0 0.95. That means, basically, we can reproduce the Bitcoin behavior in price with this orange straight line, a better orange straight line is 95% of what is going on with Bitcoin. In other words, it's, this model is 95, quote unquote, percent precise, or, you know, correct, whatever you want to say. It's, it's just a way, there are, it's, you have to be a little bit more precise in the terminology of interpretation, but I'm trying to make it as simple as possible. It does a very good job in describing, even if it is up and down, these up and downs, why, why a straight line would do a good job with something that is, a, is going up and down? Because it's up and going up and down. So in a sense, they cancel each other, right? So the going up cancel with going down. So basically, it's a straight line, right? When you take an average. In fact, that you could do, right? Uh, many people that trade are familiar with what is called a moving average. Take a moving average, average these bumps up, uh, away, and that average will follow this straight line. It's, you know, it's there. It doesn't matter how you look at it. This behavior is there. It cannot be denied. It cannot be unseen. It's there. Uh, it's a question of interpreting what it means, etc. And I gave you some interpretation. So, and, and maybe I can show you this slide. I, 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 and I, I, again, forgive me if I continue to work and I, let, I don't let you ask you questions. But maybe I can take a pause and you can ask me some questions. And then maybe yeah. we, can, we can talk a little bit about this graph because it puts the power laws in a contest. Yeah, That's definitely. Why they are so important. Why we are so important. Definitely, definitely. Real quick, it is crazy to to go back and look at the the growth of Bitcoin. It's quite mind blowing. And maybe we can. So we're already over an hour. Unfortunately, I, I wish we could keep yeah. going, but maybe we can wrap it up within the next sure. five to fifteen minutes. And right. you're welcome to talk about this this slide in particular. But also, I want to ask you at least one more question. Sure. If your model does get, because I'm definitely a fan of your model. Um, I think it's quite fascinating. If your model eventually does break or there is a phase shift that's unexpected in the future, would you be, would you think, would you say that it's going to be to the upside or would you say that it's going to be to the downside? If you had to pick one, what would you expect? Well, that is a point with the phase shifts. Uh, they're, by definition, they are pre unpredictable, right? Because, uh, um, you know, if there is a, a really, really catastrophic event, well, then the model will break. And doesn't matter how resilient our law are, 
the, you know, that is also the other aspect. If an event is not that catastrophic, then there will be like that COVID a little deep, right? You can even see it there. I don't know if you see it from this graph, but I can recognize it. Is that a little crazy deep? It touched the bottom, you know, the trend, and then it went up. That is what I'm talking about. This is how resilient these systems are. Even COVID didn't make it go away. In fact, actually, kind of almost like a, a, a reset it, you know, to this trend. And that is what is going on. If it is bigger than that, you know, many people say, uh, the other thing I don't understand because I'm trying to understand the community. I love the community. I love everybody. You got and everybody besides scammers because that is also the thing that happens when you have this incredible growth. You have all, like, you know, in the talks with this guy, Jeffrey West, uh, X, he always says, yeah, with all the beautiful things that you get by living in a city, you also get all the bad stuff. Like, you know, more thieves, more uh, scammers, more uh, uh, bad things, you know. And, they, and we have a lot of scammers coming in in the world, Bitcoin world. But besides these people, everybody's good intention, right? Everybody wants a better world and so on. So, But sometimes, you know, people fall in some logical mistakes. You know, they want inflation, you know, like, oh, uh, what if uh, uh, there is hyperinflation? I don't know, you know, I don't want, I don't, hopefully it doesn't happen, you know, because if it happens and we became, you know, a Weimar Republic, probably this doesn't hold anymore, you know, because I, I'm I'm doing this uh, uh, comparison with something relatively stable like the dollar. It's not stable because there is inflation and it's stupid, but inflation is like a small little correction in comparison with Bitcoin. Not in comparison with anything else. I have graphs where I show, if you compare it with this, P500, it goes, you know, it takes out 50% of your gains in the last 20 years, but not with Bitcoin. Bitcoin is like a little correction. So I can almost, you know, don't even include it. And so, um, but if there is, uh, you know, if the US dollar goes, you know, through some kind of horrible crisis, then, you know, we have other, probably will be really bad. You know, maybe Bitcoin will be a way of saving some of your value, but we don't want that. We want, I say, we should wish for a bloodless revolution. We want a bloodless revolution. We want this thing going on for the next 10 years where we change monetary system. We go from this stupid fiat system to Bitcoin where everybody adopts Bitcoin. It's more, it's not go, uh, ruled by government. There'll be a lot of adjustment is needed, both, you know, from a practical point of view, but also psychologically and how we see the world. But we wanted to do it in a smooth, progressive fashion. And so, yeah, if there is a phase transition, that is a point. I don't know. I cannot really predict it. We are unpredictable. Also because, you know, with ICE, the example I made, we, we have a lot of examples. We study that system. We know what happened when it goes to ICE. Yes, there is a phase transition. But we know what to expect, right? With this, no, because, you know, it's a completely different experiment that we've never done in our history. In fact, even this behavior of an asset behaving like a power law is a completely new thing, you know? And so I don't know. I, I will be a bad scientist if I say, oh, I know how to predict such thing. I know two things. One, very likely it doesn't happen because it needs to be something huge, both in the positive and negative sense. And, you know, um, if it happens, it's probably, you know, so catastrophic that, we will have other worries, you know, like a war, you know, like a really uh, world war, war, and Bitcoin will still exist, will be a way to save money, but uh, maybe it doesn't fall anymore, a power law, maybe maybe goes down for a little, I don't know. I, it's so sure. complicated to imagine these scenarios that uh, I, I will go beyond my, uh, you know, uh, training and my understanding of these kind of things. Yeah. Yep. So, but uh, in general, I cool. believe in Bitcoin. I believe that it, uh, it's so powerful that if anything, see how sometimes, uh, sorry if I say this uh, last thing, do um, uh, you know how people criticize Bitcoin because it's consuming so much energy? And then it turns out that actually is a good thing because it regulates the greed. It can bring electricity in places where people don't have it. Uh, it uh, uses up uh, waste uh, to actually do something useful and improve the local economies. Bitcoin is like that. And so it's possible that actually one of the reasons we don't go to Weimar 
scenarios is because of Bitcoin. So when, you know, Kramer, I don't know if you heard him recently, he was like laughing. It's so funny. I love him because <laughs> it's such a meme. It's such a gift to us uh, for Bitcoiners that he exists, you know, because it's an infinite uh, source of material. But he also represents, you know, the people that are still thinking they're dealing with tulips. And the other day he was saying, what Bitcoin ever did uh, for uh, humanity? It almost sounds, uh, I don't know if you, have, you know that Monty Python movie where uh, the uh, Jewish rebels talk about the romance and say, you know, have you ever seen that movie? You know, The Life uh, of Brian? No. You should watch it because there is a scene where these guys come together and say, okay, we should pick out the romance uh, from, uh, uh, you know, from Palestine or, you know, the Jewish land. And, uh, uh, they are the invaders, you know, they are horrible. And uh, uh, whatever whatever they did for us, exactly what Kramer said about Bitcoin. Then a guy says, well, they built roads. Well, okay, but beside roads, what uh, what they did for us? Well, they brought uh, um, laws. Okay, but beside laws and roads, and, you know, it goes on like that and like that because, uh, you know, Romans did a lot of good things. They come and they did all these amazing things. And, yes, we were invaders, etc., but, it's a joke, right? But the same thing with Bitcoin. What did Bitcoin do for us? Everything, right? So it's possible that actually these crazy scenarios don't happen because Bitcoin stabilizes not just yeah. the greed, but also the economy. And, yep. you know, maybe it avoids wars and things like that. So it's a stabilizing, powerful presence. And we want to root for the power law because the power law is the expression of that. Yeah. Uh, one last question, actually, that, that just kind of came to mind. I mean... I remember when Plan B's model first came out and people thought that maybe the market would see the model, realize it might be right and front run the halving. And, you know, that obviously didn't happen back in 2020. And, you know, arguably it's not happening. If you're following his model this time either. What about from from your model's perspective? Like if your model is correct and, you know, Bitcoin is supposed to be $1 million 10 years from today, you know, the compound annual growth rate for Bitcoin from today's price would be like 50%, 100%. Would the market potentially start to, you know, price that in if everyone's stuck in index bonds expecting 7%? You would think if, if your model is so correct and so accurate, then maybe the market might try to front run your model. Would you buy that idea? Would you disagree with that idea? How do you it's think about that? It's a very good question and it's a, you know, very logical and uh, reasonable question. My answer to that is this, right? Okay, the an- so here is there are many different power law, right? Of course, the animals don't know about power law. They follow it because it's their physiology, etc. But what about cities? Cities are made of people, right? And they follow power laws. Like here, I give you an example, right? This is, for example, yeah, I don't go into the details, but I, I here is I'm showing this because believe me, there are papers where people write and they say, oh, well, look at this. These are these are different lines. There are many different cities in the country. Look at see different sizes of cities. But they all follow power law. People are discussing this. They are giving lectures. You think because if we went to a lecture that says New York behaves like a power law, and maybe you know a lot of people go there, that is going to affect the fact that it behaves like a power law? No, because the reason why they behave like a power law is is because there are all these very complex mechanisms, some of them that we don't understand, that rule and govern these behaviors. People front-running stuff, it's already included in a sense, right? Because, for example, we know already that there are these events called halving, and people do things. Like maybe this is exactly what happens. This is actually maybe the anticipation. So it doesn't have anything to do with, in that way, Maybe one day at a time you interview me and we talk about how to compare different models like S2F with these, or, you know, but I don't want to do a polemic thing, but S2F actually is wrong. Not just from a stat point of view, it's really, there is something logical about S2F, but I don't want to go there, okay? But so at once in your question, you can see anticipation, people reacting to things happen. And if, for example, the bubble could be that. People know that there is dissolving, they do things like, you know, maybe they get excited, they started to buy, so they react. But you see what happened. At a point, this frenzy reaches a point where the system says, I cannot take it anymore. 
and he wants to go back. It's adjusting itself. That is part of the philosophy of the power laws. They, it's a perturbation. It's like when you raise your heartbeat and then it's too high, you need to rest, and it goes back to normal. That is exactly what happens here. And so even yeah. if people do silly things like that, another thing like, you know, Sailor, I love Sailor. You know, he's amazing. Thank you, you know, to be part of the community. But sometimes people, unless we have like a very consistent understanding, they say things like you say, all your models are destroyed. Oh, if a bunch of uh, billionaires go and buy, yeah, okay, it will make spike the price, but eventually we'll go back to the power law. Because nobody can control Bitcoin. And by the way, the people who repeat that basically are saying that billionaires can control Bitcoin. Why billionaires will be different from the government? I don't know why. You know, no, we, we want a system that cannot be controlled by anybody, sailor included. I'm sorry, sailor. I love you, but don't say things like that because they don't look good. They don't look good for adoption and for us repeating that this is a fair system that should be adopted by the entire world that is defeating. So if it is can be controlled by a bunch of billionaires, he, he had a good intention. He wanted to say, hey, you know, Bitcoin is being adopted by more people, even billionaires. I don't know what. I think it was going in that direction. But even things like that will create a spike and then the price goes back because these mechanisms are bigger than us. Are they are collective working together to that is showing in this organized fashion? It's beautiful. It's amazing. I don't know if we really completely understand it. You know why cities behave in this way? Like I described before. Look at this. You know this. Is, maybe we can conclude on this slide, right? Animals do that. Animals follow these very uh, very precise trajectories that are governed by. Power laws. How the hell animals know how to do that? Well, because we have a mechanism inside them, you know, their physiology, it's similar, you know, between all these animals. Uh, and even if you have different lifestyles, we do different things, they follow this general trend that, uh, you know, it's a relationship between the mass of the animal and metabolic rate. Languages, you think that Latin and uh, Sanskrit uh, or, you know, uh, ancient Egyptian or English are not really very similar, but they behave in a power law fashion in terms of how many words you have in the language. They behave in a very, say, how, how is possible? You know, how did they come up with this? It doesn't matter. Do you think that people are aware of it now? Languages follow power laws. They change the number of words that they are going to use. No, you know, they can try. <laughs> it's not going to work. You know, So that is the entire philosophy behind power laws. These are things that, somehow regulate the behavior of systems like Bitcoin, which is a network. And yes, you can have these local disturbances, but the overall behavior, it's not controllable by people, no matter what they do. Yeah, It's crazy. I know that it's crazy and it's difficult to accept. And I could be wrong. It's just a scientific hypothesis. But if I am right, the consequences are amazing. If it gives us a completely different perspective about what Bitcoin is, it changes your understanding, it makes you love Bitcoin even more, you know? It's <laughs> incredible. You, you definitely have made me more bullish on the power law model. This is this is pretty good. Um, and I guess like going back to the, you know, the market attempting to price in the model, it's the, if the price did get too high, then people like you or people that see this model might also sell Bitcoin and the price would come back down within the model. Yeah, there are forces like that, right? There, there are forces like that. This is why also the other thing, like when people say, oh, Bitcoin is scarce. Like in which sense Bitcoin is scarce? You know, it's always available. You can always go on the market, buy how much Bitcoin you want. If you buy, if you go there and start to buy a lot, that then the price goes up. So it's more difficult to buy, but it's not scarce in that sense that uh, it's right, we are running out of Bitcoin. You know, there, it's, it's an open market. It's an open system. It's a reacting and there are all these feedback loops, and they are not really controllable. I don't think they are controllable by anybody. By you know, maybe in the beginning, in the beginning when the system was very small, and also this is kind of goes along to what you were asking. You know, as the system becomes bigger and bigger, you need bigger and bigger events to really change this trajectory. I don't think a, a small group of billionaires will be able to do that. I don't think even nations. Will. Because all of a sudden, you know, it needs to be really dramatic, like a, have a level of a third world war, really, to change this. 
uh, at, at, in particular where we are right now, uh, the size of the market cap, in fact, if you go, you know, by this cycle. So the lesson about this cycle that we are going to the next new normal, right? After the cycle is over and we go back to the trajectory, many times people say, but uh, what happened? So, it, for example, this cycle is possible that, uh, you know, because I have also these models where I'm trying to model the bubbles, you know, and I make prediction of the top because I added that component on top. But the component, I'm not very attached to it because it could break because it's the weakest part of uh, trying to predict these peaks and so on. It's very difficult. But that bottom line seems to be a very strong base uh, that the model seems to follow. So it's one of the ways to test if a model will continue to work by the time we go back to the uh, next bottom, right? And that bottom should be around seventy, eighty thousand dollars $80,000, something like that. That means we will never see prices below that. So basically, uh, you know, kind of close to 100. Let's round it to 100. So after this cycle, 100,000 will be the new normal. So we will, you know, like people were talking about Bitcoin being amazing when it was one dollar, and for them it was, whoa, you know, one dollar. That's what we had in mind. Then it became ten and hundred, and they started. People started to shift their understanding of Bitcoin. And now, you know, for us, it's normal to think about Bitcoin fifty thousand dollars. If you had a time machine and tell people, majority of people, you know, ten years ago, twelve years ago, Bitcoin would be on the order of fifty thousand dollars. Where we laugh, most people will laugh, think that you're crazy. But now, for us, is you know, if you can. If you can get Bitcoin for ten thousand, you will buy it right now, right? You will sell really your shares and go to buy uh, Bitcoin for ten thousand. Uh, but you know, when the cycle is over, hundred thousand will be your normal. And then finally, you know, ten years from now will be one million. So that is the lesson that we have, right? About with this power law, that is this progression towards higher and higher price is basically unavoidable if the model is right. It's quite fascinating. Giovanni, this is awesome. Thanks for taking the time to to sit down with us. We'll put links to, you know, a bunch of different things in the show notes. Where do you want to send people after this? Is it your ex, you know, another website? Yeah, so basically I made a uh, um, a life choice recently, you know, because I was fascinated by Bitcoin. So this is kind of the cycle of my life. You know, I started with being fascinated by Bitcoin and that, you know, it was not really my full time. um, Adventure. Now it is. I made this a uh, kind of professional, but also personal choice of being fully dedicated to this. I want to help people. Uh, it's my new job, also. So I have a Patreon account because you know, being a new job, I'm asking also for people to help me and support me. I'm very reasonable because I want people to buy Bitcoin instead of you know spending money on other things. But you know, if you have a, if, if you like my work and you want to support me, I have Patreon. And the Patreon gives you access to actually our Discord community. So I have a, a group of uh, people who want to focus on this because, you know, there is other things like uh, the power law also allows you to understand the cycles better. I have these models where I, I have a basically a clock that tells you where we are, uh, different places in the cycle. So I want to help people to do DCA using this knowledge. So I can help you. If you know, I can follow you better in a small little community. So if you come to the Discord channel, we are there. We talk. I give like little classes about all these topics. Uh, we have indicators uh, on Trading View that people can use to do DCA. We are preparing an app uh, that can do this. Uh, basically, the idea will be it uh, depends on wh- how far you are from the general trend. You regulate your uh, DCA, right? So when you are in the bottom, you do more. When you are close to the top, you kind of stop, you know, and uh, um, and so these are all all the things we do. We have also a YouTube channel because I like also the aspect of uh, spreading the news. Uh, so uh, I can give you links where people can go. So the main three places are my Discord channel that you have access to the Patreon and you have all these extra tools, classes, all kind of things like that. You can come to my uh, X account where I, I post regularly. Uh, there, there are links to these uh, charts that are updated daily. So you can click on the link of my X account under my profile. And you can get the charts every day uh, with updates. Um, I'm very active on X. I, I, I try to answer everybody. So if you have a questions, come there. I interact with you. I love the interactions. Just, you know, 
And you, you can come and criticize and give me your opinion because I'm looking for that too. But, you know, be nice and be logical. You know, just don't make claims without having spent some time trying to understand what this is all about. And uh, with YouTube channel, because uh, my son actually is a video maker. He's a filmmaker and uh, he joined my adventure. You know, we are working on this together as a team. And he's making all these videos with higher production where we discuss these themes. So these three places, and then we give you links to all of them so people can explore them. Perfect. Yeah. Well, thanks again, Giovanni. This was fantastic. We'll put all those links below. Thank you so much uh, for the opportunity to talk with you and be sent about with Power Law.